Uh, thank you very much um, for inviting me. I'm a little hesitant, as uh, since I'm not quite sure whether you are going to, I, whether you're expecting my kind of lecture. But anyway, <laughs> I can't do uh, very much about it now. Anyway, so I'll just um, uh, tell you what I thought I would tell you. Um, at Utrecht, uh, as cultural historians, and those are basically historians, people who work with stuff in the past, um, and then in the field of culture. So I'll explain that to Unica once uh, she comes back. Uh, it's also very difficult. Um, we have several large text mining projects based on newspapers. Um, and we call this cultural text mining. What we're interested in are cultural patterns in the past. That's quite simple. Um, at least it's simple to say this. It's difficult to put it into practice. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords going around, as uh, Francisca pointed out. Uh, but there's very little actual research, you know, getting things done. What does it mean, these buzzwords, when you put them into practice? Now, um, in, in our projects, there's a number of PhD students, postdocs, who will get these results out. Um, well, they're putting them out now, but the first PhDs, for example, will be delivered, I think, uh, hopefully next year. They're well on track, and then we'll see what this means in terms of research output. Now, a year ago, um, <coughs> I uh, sort of developed a mission for myself. I'm a historian. Historians are pretty conservative. Um, I don't mean that as a bad thing, but they tend to be hesitant when it comes to digital humanities. And at that point in time, we had these large projects, and I became known in my own history department as the Excel guy, the spreadsheet guy. <laughs> I love numbers. And, well, they gave me this management position, and uh, I developed a huge spreadsheet, and with the press of the button, I could um, count how many teaching hours a person, uh, I, I knew what he, when he or she was born, uh, how old he or she was, um, uh, how many years ago until that person would be retired. I mean, all kinds of information in connection with the number of teaching hours uh, the, the person still had to do. So nobody could escape from my, uh, um, um, my attention. Uh, I had everybody in focus. Now, obviously, um, having a system like this, which is, you know, it's a little digital humanities. I wasn't going to convince my colleagues that digital humanities is fun. So I thought I'd do it another way. And that is when I presented, and I presented this to some people here already in the room. They've, they've, they've seen the first version of this PowerPoint, which is called Tracing Conceptual Change in Messy Data, number one, and had a different um, subtitle. I can't quite remember what. But what I did in that, um, that lecture was to present a number of tools which could be used to um, do research into newspapers, uh, um, tools which would be useful to my colleagues. And my colleagues are not um, per se interested in digital humanity. So they need robust stuff uh, that really works and get, gets results. And that was what my talk was about, um, um, the first lecture was about. This lecture is slightly different in the sense it's built in this way. The first Part is a very quick review of that previous lecture. Which tools were there um, uh, around about a year ago? Um, and then something happened. Um, I got a sabbatical. I finally found time to do my own research. And I thought, OK, these tools are very interesting. They work to some extent. But they don't do quite exactly what I want them to do. So hence. I started becoming a little more self-reliant. Um, so that's the second part of my lecture. And the third uh, bit will be um, which lessons did I learn from this, you know, this bout of self-reliance. So um, how do I switch on to the, yeah, okay. That is what I have on my screen as well. Now, first of all, my research question. I'm not going to, uh, th th there's a lot of theory, a lot of problems with this research question which is uh, another fun bit, but I'm not going to um, explain that to you because you're not probably interested in my own personal research question. You're inter interested in the methodology, the, the digital humanity side of things. Um, but this is my research question. I'm interested in popular concepts of Europe, popular concepts of Europe in newspapers. I'm using newspapers as a source. Uh, it's a kind of data-driven research. I'm interested in what is out there. I'm not interested in what institutions think, what philosophers uh, tell us we should think, what politicians do. I'm interested in what journalists who cater to a large market, you know, uh, newspapers are read by lots of ordinary people. I'm interested in that mindset. That is, for me, a cultural pattern. So, in other words, um, 
my hypothesis is simply that football has always been much more important than Brussels. Football is a way of um, uh, getting a European thing done because people like football and do it in Europe. There's, you know, uh, Europe uh, Cup competitions and so on. Um, it's much more convincing to people, much more, it, it's a kind of bottom-up um, uh, concept of U uh, Europe. And the the uh, third part of this Boolean uh, research question is, uh, is the digital humanity side. Okay, given this research question, how do we trace these concepts uh, of Europe in digitized newspapers, digitized or newspapers that have been digitized in such a way that the quality is not perfect. Now, anybody who has worked with uh, any newspapers uh, around will know what I mean. I'll give you an example later on. These newspapers are messy, or the other term Francisca used just now, they're noisy. I have three approaches to this research question. One is looking at the mundane in newspapers. For example, crossword puzzles. Things everybody does which aren't really noticed, have never, have been very little research, at least by historians. Um, were there European, were European notions and words used in crossword puzzles? Things people did every day. Um, and weather forecasts uh, is another very mundane thing. Another uh, thing I'm interested in is the life and afterlife of political visions. Uh, this bit, for example, pan-Europe was an ideal which everybody's forgotten now, but which was very strong in the 1920s and 1930s. It was a very powerful vision of a future of Europe. Uh, intellectuals were interested in it. Did this have a life in newspapers and did it have an afterlife? And a third bit is competition, so that's where football gets in. Now, these, this is a three-pronged approach. There, there, there's more possible, but this is what I'm going to do for the time being. And my case for today is the weather forecast, so I'll come back to that later. Um, but first, back to the first lecture, this, this, this toolbox I needed. I said I need to trace, trace conceptual change. This is what I want to do. In lots of data, whether newspapers are big data or middle big data or relatively small data, after all, is a moot question. I mean, it's open for discussion. It's a question of definition, I think. But, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of articles in the end, in the collection I am using. These paper newspapers uh, have been uh, digitized, but the quality is not so very good. Uh, I want to do this over a longer period of time. So basically the 20th century or the long 20th, 20th century, which has a bit of the 19th century in it, 1880, um, 1990. That's about the period of time I do at the moment. Uh, and preferably in more than lang uh, one language. So um, one of the projects we have in Utrecht does um, multilinguality. It looks at French, German, uh, Dutch newspapers, um, Luxembourgish as well. Um, but basically, um, at this moment, more important for me are language variations over time. So a language, you know, Dutch is the language uh, of the, uh, the newspapers I, uh, I use. Um, the Dutch uh, 100 years ago was different from Dutch now. So there's, there's, it's a different language uh, with some imagination and you could uh, posit that. It has the same kind of problems. Translation problems, meanings change, etc., etc. So a comparative analysis over time and space. Now this is an example of the messy data. I like this one very much because uh, it's completely illegible. Uh, anybody who, who knows Dutch, um, probably a very small minority here, will see that it, this is nonsense. It's, uh, it's, it looks like a very strange language. The only word that has been, you know, you could pick out is Europa. The ship, th this is about the launching of the ship Europa in 1930. It was a very famous ship which crossed the Atlantic uh, very rapidly and you know, often came in, um, uh, in newspapers. A, a lot was said about it. But this is, uh, this is you know, one of the worst uh, bits of newspaper I could find. Uh, most of it is much better. Um, and I'm not saying that because my colleague from the uh, National Library of the Netherlands will be here tomorrow. Um, basically, I can say anything I like <laughs> at, this, at this point. But the, the, the quality is, is not... I, I, I would like it to be much better. Now, this is one of the first tools um, which I uh, showed in the first lecture. It's simply an engram viewer. It's an engram viewer based on the Dutch newspaper corpus. So what I've done here is type in the word Europe and you get this graph, which has all kinds of things which um, I find problematic. So it's insightful. It gi gives you a, ni a nice number of spikes. There's wo especially one spike in the Second World War, and that's simply because there were a lot of newspapers around there. All the major newspapers disappeared, and a lot of you know, um, local uh, kind of resistance newspapers emerged, and that's why you have 
this high frequency. So it's been normalized, but not in a way that I find very uh, interesting. Also, there are a lot of mistakes in this corpus. Uh, you know, uh, uh, newspaper, complete newspapers have been uh, digitized twice. And this simply takes the whole lot and gives you a graph. So it's insightful, it gives you an impression, but it's very untrustworthy. And it's too rigid because it's based on the whole corpus of the Dutch National Library. This is Texcavator. Texcavator is something we developed, um, well, it was developed in Amsterdam initially, and now it's being developed uh, in, um, in Utrecht. It's being cleaned, it's being um, uh, coded in modular form, so, so a lot of uh, money is being put into it, and we want this to be the showcase of, of Utrecht, and I think we're going to uh, be able to pull it off, because it does lots of interesting stuff. Um, it's, it allows, it's, it's a, a, a way of making your own engrams, uh, but tailor-made, so you can specify exactly which articles you want <coughs> to be in this, in this timeline. It allows you to produce word clouds, um, it allows you to look at the metadata, um, you can call up the original newspapers, you can look at the OCR version, so it's, it's a very uh, useful tool. Uh, which we also use to download data from the National Library. So we can uh, have our own data sets locally on our own computers. Now, once Texcavator is made open to the public, this download f function will disappear, obviously, because there's a lot of copyright issues involved. We uh, the National Library doesn't want its newspapers to be spread in bulk you know, across the world. Um, and there's a fifth um, uh, aspect to Texcavator, which is has been added very recently, Shiko, which I'll show you in a minute. It's another tool we've used. So it's got this temporal dimension, which historians like. Th that's why I'm showing you a timeline of Miss Europe. You can see that the Miss Europe elections were very popular in the 1920s, the late 1920s, and then they somehow decreased. But even in the 1970s, uh, uh, 80s, th they were still around. They're still around now, but nobody cares for Miss Europe anymore. Uh, but was hugely popular at some, uh, at some point in time. Uh, it's proven, we've worked a lot with Texcavator, but it's restricted to the uh, KB corpus. One of the things we want to do is connect other um, stuff to it, which can be done once we've coded this in uh, this modular form. Uh, this is uh, an example of a corpus linguistics pro uh, program, ANTCONC, which I showed in this previous lecture. It's very useful, it's proven, and a lot of people have been working with corpus linguistics uh, software. Uh, there's more than this around. Um, but this is an example of AntConc, which I've then transferred into a spreadsheet, the results. Um, it has no temporal di dimension, so there's a lot of good stuff being produced by linguists, but they are rarely um, have this timeline function. Historians want to look over time, changes over time. And um, the um, problem with corpus linguistics software is that it's usually uh, synchronic rather than diachronic. But what you see here is that Europe is related to Europe Cup, to Western Europe, it's related to America, it's related, this is from the 1980s, to uh, atom bombs. So it gives you a nice impression of what went on in newspapers. Uh, this is topic modeling, which you'll probably know, it's a way of generating topics from a large data set. You know, you put lots of data, uh, lots of text in a bag of words, uh, or in a bag, and you call this a bag of words, and then, you know, um, uh, topic model the stuff, and you get lists of words which belong together, uh, they are a logical distribution in some way. There's, there's an algorithm and the different algorithms um, doing this. Uh, and in some way you could, you could say that these, okay, these words belong together. They represent a specific topic. I mean, you could say how many words you want and how many topics you want to generate. Um, and this is a, a bad example because you see the colors are all mixed up. Uh, and there's question marks right uh, on, on the right on the topic. So I was unable to really identify topics on the basis of this um, a data set, and the problem here is not the, the software, I think, uh, but mostly the, um, the OCR. Um, but there's a w there are ways around this. Uh, but again, this has no temporal dimension. This is a, uh, a, a diachronic approach, uh, a synchronic approach rather than a diachronic approach. Um, then there are software packages. This is one I often use for different purposes. Uh, this is SPS Modeler, so it's uh, the, the little sister of SPS Statistics, which you may know. It's this large um, statistics uh, software uh, uh, set produced by uh, IBM. Um, so this is um, SPS Modeler, which is a text analytics program used by companies to um, analyze the Internet. So if you can analyze the Internet, why not analyze newspapers? 
And here, actually, you see this is, this is based on a, uh, a, a somewhat smaller data set in which the word pan-Europe uh, occurs. This um, a European ideal from the 1920s and 1930s. And you see that it's very plausible what happens here. I'm not sure whether you can read this, but the red circle um, brings together pan-Europe as an ideal with Aristide Briand. And Aristide Briand was a French uh, politician who uh, was very interested in this pan-European ideal, which itself was first developed by a, um, an Austrian who had a, um, a Japanese mother and an Austro-Hungarian father and was very much you know, this kind of cross-boundary person who was interested in European ideals. Uh, but there's also relations there with uh, disarmament with Benito Mussolini, who fascists also had uh, European uh, ideals, uh, and so on and so on. So this is interesting, but again, um, there is no temporal dimension, this is used for the internet, and uh, very problematic, it's commercial software, so it is a black box. You don't really know what happens and you can't tweak the stuff yourself because it's all um, behind a very heavy layer of, um, well, uh, software. And you have to be a hacker to be able to, to do that and that is something that is beyond my ability. Now, there is uh, the final uh, tool, which is something which is very advanced. Um, we, as I said, we've built it into Texcovator. Um, it is called Chico. What it does is it tries to, the ambulance is gone. It tries to, uh, um, what it basically does, it, it, it takes text, con uh, converts text into mathematics in a very uh, complicated way. So it's, it's, it uses a spatial model. And that's why it's called vector space modeling. Um, and then uh, it's, um, what it does is try to uh, um, trace meanings over time. So the first meaning is, is uh, given by a certain distribution of words. And this distribution of words um, is, is then, um, uh, other distributions are built on that first distribution and so on and so on. Uh, the effect is that you get a, uh, a meaning that shifts over time. So what happened here in this specific graph, it's, it's got lots of colors and you probably can't read the letters, and, oh, yeah, and they're in Dutch anyway. But what happened here is the word war, the Dutch word for war, oorlog, was uh, used as a keyword, one keyword in the beginning. And it leads to all kinds of things which are connected with, with war. Um, and it tells you a lot about Dutch history in this period, and this period is 1950 to uh, 1990. It has connections with um, all kinds of things that happened in the, world, in the Second World War, with liberation, persecution of Jews. Um, it has to do with um, uh, the, the occupation. So, so, that, so uh, interesting, interestingly, uh, the word war, if, if you put that in Chico, it tells you that in Dutch newspapers, uh, the uh, dominant uh, association with war over time was apparently something to do with the Second World War, not all the other wars that were obviously also reported on the newspapers, but the Second World War and all these different aspects of the Second World War. So um, that is interesting. This is a, a research tool which is still a very much a black box. I mean, th it is so difficult to understand what is actually happening in that thing um, that you have to have a, uh, a PhD in mathematics uh, basically to, to, uh, to understand that. Uh, so uh, there are ways around this, but this is a problem. Um, Francisca, you referred to that uh, a moment ago. It is a black box and black boxes are inescapable. I mean, if I think of my colleagues in the department, if I want to convince them, I have to convince them that, okay, this is a black box. It will never become uh, a, another kind of box, um, but you can still work with it because, and that we have to find a solution to that. Um, what, what I think we should do is, is put a lot of, um, um, you know, <laughs> practical research results uh, against uh, Chico and against traditional research and see what the, see if, it w see if, if that is plausible. Because if you can say, okay, uh, Chico generates pos possible results for this reason, then you can use it for other uh, research tasks uh, without necessarily understanding completely what happens in that black box. But, second part of my, uh, my talk. Um, not quite sure when I started, but somebody will shout probably when I have to stop. Um, I was analyzing these weather forecasts. I was interested in weather forecasts. Because weather forecasts, people read weather forecasts every day. And there's an expression in English, the constant drip wears out the stone. 
So it's a communication theory as well. It's, a drip, it's called literally the drip drip effect. So people look at weather forecasts every day. Um, in the end, they will have a kind of a framework in their mind which reflects the weather forecast. And in the weather forecast, there's always a picture of Europe. Uh, initially, there weren't any uh, pictures, but there were words. And later, there were pictures with words. I'm interested in the words at this moment. So people look at weather forecasts every day. They get a kind of a geographical frame of reference in their heads over time. And this is a cultural pattern. It's very deep um, within the, uh, the mindset of people. And it gives you an idea of what, how Europe looked like to people in the past. And what I'm interested in, of course, is whether this changes over time. So I was interested in weather forecasts. And the simple thing I wanted to do was this. I wanted to determine the frequency of locations mentioned in weather forecasts and then plot them on a dynamic time-based graph. Right? I have newspapers over time. A dynamic time-based graph is, a, is a, you know, kind of like, like a heat map that changes over time. And there's lots of stuff you can find on the internet that does this. But the first part is, was really the, the most important. Determine the frequency of locations mentioned in weather forecasts. I mean, how easy can it get in terms of digital humanities? So this is an example of a weather forecast from uh, the Telegraaf uh, on my birthday. I thought I had to find a map which was somehow resonates with me as well. So um, the 11th of February, um, a year after I was born. I was born in 1964. I think this one is from 1965. It says the weather in Europe, and I've in, in red I've um, mentioned uh, the names of places I'm interested in. It says Southwest Ireland, it says West and Middle Europe, uh, it says Spain, it says Luvlera. Anybody guess what Luvlera is? It's the Riviera, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's an OCR mistake. But for the rest, it's it's quite you know it's quite legible. Uh, the Alps are there, Alpengebiet, Alp, Alpen is Alps. And uh, it refers to Middle Europe. And the word temperature is important. I've outlined that in blue. But this is a, an example of a weather forecast. There's a text on top. There's a, list, there's a text at the bottom. There's a list of towns as well, uh, which, um, which, which are weather stations, basically. And what I want to do is simply count the frequency of all the geographical locations. This was my problem. There was nothing out there that could help me do this in the way I wanted to do it. Such a very simple thing. So this was really the only thing I could do, um, but I'm glad I did it. It was great fun. And I'm going to tell you about the fun bit now, which was write down my methodology, which of course I did after I did all the stuff and I forgot half and I had to begin again. And that's the way researchers work, but uh, uh, we're all humans, so this will be recognizable. Um, but I'm, I'm, this is probably superfluous to most of you, but to my colleagues in the history department, it isn't. Historians are not used to write, writing down their methodology. They simply read stuff and write a narrative. That's how they do research. But they've never really you know, written down their own method. Uh, it's, it's basically a workflow. It's, it's not much more than that. In four steps, which I'm going to explain now, exactly what I did. And It'll show you where I became self-reliant and where I could use the robust tools that are available to us, or at least to me, um, when I began this research. I wanted to extract per decade, because you, can f uh, you, won't, you won't find very large changes within a, a, a smaller amount of time, so I'm doing this per decade so I can move through the 20th century quickly. Uh, extract from the, uh, the, the Delphi data set. The Delphi data set is basically the, the newspapers in the, uh, which, which are kept by the um, Dutch National Library, which is about a terabyte. Uh, I, want, I wanted all articles and all advertisements published between 1880 and 1990 containing the word temperature and then the rest. So this gives me all versions of temperature. Because temperature, as you saw on the previous slide, um, or the one before that, um, in weather forecasts, you always have the word temperature. So I thought with this way, I could you know, capture all weather forecasts insofar as they had been OCR to, uh, uh, in a reasonable way. And why all articles and, uh, and, and uh, advertisements? That's because the segmentation of the, uh, in the Dutch newspapers hasn't been done, has been done very well, but not well enough. So some weather forecasts are called advertisements and others are called articles. 
um, and I looked in both places to get as much as I wanted. Then I had to reduce the number of, of um, uh, records I got because you know all I uh, what, what I got are all words or all, all articles in the advertisements containing the word temperature, which could be adverts. They could be you know reports about the temperature somewhere on the other side of the world for uh, you know a, a car blew up because its motor got too hot. Uh, that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of uh, things in there. And then I used a string query to reduce the number of um, articles by searching, it's basically a Boolean query, uh, for strings which contain words like cloudy uh, or hail or snow or rain or barometer or depression. Or think of all the weather words, uh, all possible weather words there in there. Then, um, so that's the very, you know, the bit in very small, small. Um, uh, were, um, letters. Uh, then I further reduced the data set to, um, uh, to get a data set that was consisted exclusively of weather forecasts. And that I was able to do. Um, I got, a, a, um, a, I, I think, a 99.9% .9 score of texts that were weather forecasts. Then I divided these into uh, the, the different newspapers. So I had this, this data set and I said, okay, I want this newspaper and that newspaper, regional newspapers and national newspapers and local newspapers because that's interesting to see you, the, where the patterns are, but also because each of these newspapers, because of the different printing text techniques, the, the different paper quality probably um, have different OCR issues. And I wanted to sort these OCR issues because I further had to go, I had, I had to go on. I had to, um, that was my next step. Uh, get a list of place names and further refine the data set. Now, first thing I did was differentiate between locations. You have towns and cities, that's one kind of location. Leuven, for example, is it mentioned in um, uh, weather reports. And there are all kinds of very strange place names you come across when you do this. Sint Job in Goor, which uh, you know, if, if you if you're able to, um, if you if you if you know Dutch, it's 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 it's, in a, it's a very quaint Belgian name, but uh, Silly Silly is also a Belgian name, so there are all kinds of weird Belgian place names. Uh, Cor Corny Corny is on the French side of the Belgian border, but no, uh, there's the whole internet sites are devoted to strange place names, I and mean, you come across them when you do this kind of research. It's such great fun. You get very weird countries like Liechtenstein. Anybody from Liechtenstein here? Okay, sorry. Uh, you, you get, uh, oh, this is being recorded. Um, you, you, get <laughs> you get very interesting countries like Liechtenstein. Um, you get regions within a country, Friesland, Bavaria, for example, and anything uh, else you can think of. Um, and you get regions across countries, which is another uh, different kind of location. Lapland, uh, Lapland, the Alps, or the North Pole which is also uh, a location which is mentioned in weather reports, you know, a kind of high pressure area coming from the North Pole, or cold winds blowing from the North Pole, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you have to do this and think about it. It's pretty, pretty uh, um, intensive, but you only need to do that once. Then the next step in the workflow was to generate a very basic list of place names, place names of which I could be sure they would be mentioned in all, um, at least one of them would be mentioned in all weather forecasts, right, so that I could again then further refine um, the data set to have those weather forecasts that mention place names, because there are also weather forecasts that don't mention place names. They're very brief in newspapers. They're just, you know, one line. The weather tomorrow will be sunny. That's it. So you don't want those weather reports, right? Because they don't have place names and they aren't, aren't the kind of uh, weather forecasts which I showed you uh, uh, in a picture earlier. Then uh, the build is where the, Dutch, the main Dutch weather station is. I'm not interested in the build or in weather forecasts which have only the build because they are the short ones. So I removed those as well. And then, then I, I got this, you know, 99.9% uh, kind of data set which was useful to me. Then you have to get a list of names in which each category is, um, uh, is, is mentioned. And many of these, um, you can only do this for two things, for towns and for countries. You have lists of all the towns in the world. Uh, you can find them on GitHub. I use this one, which is a, a, a JSON uh, file. Um, so you have to learn uh, JSON to, to get your head around it, uh, which has simply all the towns in the world. And I have all the towns in Europe. About, there's 48,965. 48,965. That's a very, very long list uh, for Europe alone. And I have a list of countries. It's lo longer than you think. But regions within a country uh, and uh, regions across countries, 
You can only get a, uh, an, uh, an idea of that by reading the weather uh, forecasts, by doing close reading, by looking what is actually there. That's how I discovered the North Pole. The North Pole is in there. I wouldn't have thought of that beforehand. So it's a lot of, um, you know, it takes a lot of time, this kind of work. Then I created a list of variants, um, including OCR variants of place names, using uh, regular expressions. And here you see two examples. So a regular expression is, is it's a kind of language in which you can get all kinds of um, uh, variations um, in words to denote one word. So here you see Zürich, the, the, uh, the place in Switzerland, is equal to a regular expression. And you get all variations of, of Zürich, uh, including all the uh, problems with OCR correction, because here you have a U with two dots on top. Uh, computers don't understand what that is. I make a mess of it, um, but I can find them using uh, a regular expression. The other is West Germany. Um, which has other issues, but it's, um, and I have a whole list of these. So that allows me to capture a very large number of um, place names. It's not 100% from this 99.9, .9, uh, obviously, but I uh, am able to capture quite a, a lot. And then that's the, 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 the work is done. You press a button, you think that's easy, you just press a button and the frequencies are generated. So you get a list of frequencies, but then, is the next step, which, you, which I didn't think of be beforehand. There are in those 48,965 place names, which I am using to calculate the frequencies, there are a lot of a very weird, even weirder than Sindjopit Hor, uh, place names, which I'd never thought of before, which are simply OCR mistakes. But they exist, uh, or, or names of people. Alexander is a name of a person who apparently is mentioned in the neighborhood of weather reports or in a, uh, in a, in a weather forecast, uh, but is actually also a place name. Hjo, or Hjö, anybody from Sweden? Yeah. Yep, is, okay, <laughs> is a place in Sweden, but it's also a very common, uh, well, not so very common, but it, it, it occurs quite, quite, quite regularly, an OCR mistake. It can't be a very common place name in, in Europe. No, 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 <laughs> nobody is interested, nobody reading a newspaper in, ne ne in, in the Netherlands is at all interested in the weather in that place. No, <laughs> exactly. Now, there are um, 3,135 place names which do not matter but which are, which are counted as frequency. So you have to get rid of them. Zomergem, for those, it means, uh, is a place name in Belgium. <laughs> again, I'm sorry about, Belgi uh, about this, but it, again, it's in Belgium. But it simply is uh, a reading of Zomergemiddelde, which means summer average. So what you see here, Zomergem, is, is uh, um, summer av, which is a place name in, in Belgium. But I have to get rid of it because it's not a, the place name I need in a weather forecast. Or it's, 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 uh, and I have to check this individually. I have to see whether Zomergem, this place name, uh, is actually a place or uh, an abbreviation of summer average. For each of these 3,135 things, I did this. It can be done quite rapidly. And then you have the problem of mistaken identities. That's number 12. Um, I'm not interested in Middelburg, Belgium. I'm interested in Middelburg, the Netherlands, because that is what Dutch newspapers offer in, in these weather forecasts. Uh, Los Angeles, um, Spain, is not what you get in weather forecasts. It's a reference to Los Angeles in the United States. And, and here's um, China or China in, uh, in, in Russia, which is not China, the country, but it's a place in Russia, and so on and so forth. There's a whole list, not as large as the previous one, but you have to get rid of them. So you have to iterate, you have to do the calculations again, use a list of stop words, um, the, this, this list of mistaken identities, put it through the computer again and see what it gets. Ultimately, you get something which looks like uh, a list. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but we aren't there yet. You have to normalize the frequencies of place names over the total number of records per data set so that you can compare different um, uh, data sets per decade and per newspaper. So by normalizing them, you can start comparing. Then you have to obtain the coordinates for all the place names that you um, uh, found frequencies of. Now, that is relatively easy to do. Um, there are also lists on, on, uh, somewhere in the internet out there which, which are lists of place names with the, f uh, the latitude and longitude uh, already attached. Now, there were two problems. I discovered that list too late. Now, I had already, you know, <laughs> done my stuff. Um, but that list was also much longer, so much more longer that every little tiny village was mentioned. Now, these tiny villages are not mentioned in the weather forecasts. So, I could, you know, uh, um, uh, that wasn't really a problem in the end. Uh, then you have to plot the place names and frequencies on the map because you, you have the place names, you have the frequencies, and you have the latitude and longitude. And then, okay, 
then you've done a lot of work and time for something else. Now, uh, if you look at which tools are used in each of these steps in this workflow, right? There was 1 to 17. You can see that the first bit, I used Texcavator, I used SPS Modeler, uh, I used uh, a, a spreadsheet to refine the data set, to, to extract the data set from Texcavator, to, to refine it initially. There was some manual work being done there um, in the end, um, but I could, be, could do that quite rapidly. So the result is per decade, per newspaper, a data set of about uh, between 1,000 and four or 5,000 uh, weather forecasts. But that's quite a lot of data if you put it all together. Uh, but then, um, well, there are other things like, like a browser uh, that was, you know, to search for the, uh, the, the towns, um, the, 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 the list of place names. Uh, hamster maps is a way you can get your coordinates very quickly. Remember that if you're interested in, that, in this kind of stuff. Um, you, you put in 100 place names and they give you the coordinates within 10 seconds. Uh, Car2DB, that's number 16, that is one of these commercial sites where you can you know, create your own heat maps. I'm not very happy with it. Uh, Google Fusion Tables is another option. It's, it's, it's more primitive than Car2DB. You can't do so much, but anyhow, it's, it's, uh, it allows me to get some things done, but I'm not, happy, not, not really happy yet. Uh, but all, all the other things are Python 3 scripts, right? Uh, which is fun to do, but costs a lot of time. So this is self-reliance. I mean, I didn't ask a developer uh, to write this for me because I didn't have a developer. And I thought, okay, it's interesting to, you know, to, to look under the hood and see what's happening and start writing stuff yourself. So that's what I did. Um, and it, uh, the result was this. So um, this is under the hood, right? This is a script. I, I'm, I'm so proud of it. I'm so sorry for showing it to you, but I'm so proud of it. <laughs> it works. It actually works. It looks, it looks like a big deal, but, but basically the first half is simply calling up a file which anyone can do. Um, but the, and the second bit is simply iterating, it's, it's getting the frequency. So, so you have 50,000 uh, place names and, and uh, say 4,000 weather forecasts. And what you do is shove these 50,000 place names through the weather forecast and see which, um, which, which ones remain. So it tells you if there's a frequency of zero, throw the place name away. If the frequency is higher than zero, then start counting. That's basically what it does. And it gives you this. So this is the result, and this is extremely clean. So this is based on messy data. Um, it's it's um, obviously not based on 100% records. It's not, not based on, on the, the, there's a lot of place names which got lost, but I can find the significance of what this is, the statistical significance, by comparing, and because they're weather forecasts, I know exactly how frequently weather forecasts appeared, by comparing what I have here with the total number of weather forecasts which actually appear in newspapers, but a large part of which, or a, let's say 20%, is not accessible because it simply doesn't appear in my data set because of the OCR quality. But here you see that the, uh, I have a, a city with a country, I have a category, in this case there's town. Uh, the more interesting categories, incidentally, are uh, the, the, uh, not so much the countries, but the regions which are within countries or which are spread out over countries. Uh, there's a latitude, there's a longitude, there's a frequency, and there's a normalized frequency. And then the next step is this, um, plotting this stuff on a map. And in this case, I used CAR2DB. This is based on CAR2DB. I'm not sure, can you see the uh, yellow bits and the, 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 the red towns are high concentration? What this shows you is um, you know, the 1950s, based on uh, so many um, weather forecasts for a, a popular Dutch newspaper. Um, and you can see w the extent of Europe here, right? It's based on weather stations, or partly on weather stations. But you can see that the whole Mediterranean is, is included in this map, right? So from Casablanca to uh, Tel Aviv, uh, uh, right up to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Scandinavian. There's, there's a, w a weather station even higher than the top of the PowerPoint, which uh, at some point in the 1960s, 70s, starts you know um, becoming very popular. Uh, so, so people reading uh, the, these weather forecasts—that's that's the theory. They get this kind of geographical frame of reference, and it starts changing over time. But I'm not going to show you that. This is simply um, the, the project I set myself. Okay, I have these tools. I want this. The tools couldn't do it, and I, I got there by investing a lot of time in. Um, programming myself.
Now, self-reliance then. Uh, the question is, and the, there are, I've only two more slides and then I'll stop. Um, lessons learned. What, what, what conclusions can you take from this example of a, of a use case, a, a, a researcher, you know, uh, trying to work his way around uh, things, trying to get results? Well, program is, pro programming is uh, fun. It's pleasant. It's, it's great to do. It's, I've uh, uh, made uh, alliterations so that you could remember them uh, better. It's, 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 I, I, I really love it. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely hooked. Um, um, but you have to write on your method. That's very important. Um, you have to do something with numbers. So, um, and this is again a message to many humanists. Uh, you can't escape statistics. You have to um, do statistics. Uh, so if you haven't had that in the past, you have to follow a statistics course. It uh, takes a lot of time. Um, it's arduous being autonomous and, and it's hard to stop. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to stop because I'm hooked. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's like dope. I mean, <laughs> I just can't stop. It's, it's so much fun. Um, so, th th these, these, this would be my advice to my colleagues then. Um, there isn't very much out there yet. There is a lot. There's, uh, and, and th there's very much, but not all of it is uh, useful to what you need. I mean, the available tools are great, but they're only a first step in any research. Another thing which is very important for my colleagues is to remain in control. And you can only remain in control if you have a measure of um, self-reliance, I think. So you ha have to get insight into these tools. But it's, it's a painful process. It takes you time. Um, and it's nice to do, but you have to like doing it. Um, and not everybody does. But if you, you really need to remain in control, um, but if you want this, then uh, you have to invest uh, uh, time. Help is expensive. So uh, the stuff I did, uh, a, a developer could have written that in, you know, in a, uh, half an afternoon. Uh, it took me some more time. I'll tell you how much. Um, but if you're poor, as most humanities researchers are, then um, this is the only way to go. But it gives you insight into the tools if you do it. Um, you have to get results, concrete results. Otherwise, you won't be taken seriously by people who are skeptical about digital humanities. Um, but then you see the results, and they are plausible. They they are very um, based on, on um, they're very firm, uh, um, based on real data. Small is better. So what I did, just weather reports, locations. Obviously, you can use the tool uh, I built for any other purpose. You know, where you want to count frequencies of place names in newspapers for any reason. Um, so it's it's very useful. But it's it's quite a small circumscribed. Uh, in the projects we have at Utrecht, th th we have these you know, megalomaniac tools which are really big and do lots of stuff like Chico, which is really nice, but um, they are difficult to understand. And, and small sometimes is better than big, I think. Innovation often sucks. That's my last comment and then I'll stop. Uh, what I mean here is that um, the ambitions in digital humanities are often um, also provoked by funding institutions because they, they put such great store by um, um, innovation. Everything has to be new and ambitious and big and you know, uh, great and, and you know, all these, these kind of buzzwords. And sometimes I think if you really want to get a larger part of m the research population to do digital humanities, to work with these tools on newspapers, for example, um, then a, a measure of le uh, some uh, less innovation and more conserv conservatism wouldn't be um, a very bad idea. So uh, keep it small. Um, uh, try and invest in some time uh, at some point in the things you are have already built, so that they don't just you know get lost on GitHub, um, and uh, uh, and instead that people start uh, actually start using them. And it can be done. I'm hopeful. So on that note, I think I should conclude. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Any questions, I guess? Remarks? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering now, um, it seems like you're you're convinced that humanists should be um, should know how to code, and not only you like it, but you you see value in it. Um, 
how would you, suppose that now you had money, like unlimited money, you would work with the developing team. How would you still see your coding skill as valuable? Only as, you know, I know what you're doing, or will there be a kind of separation of, um, how do you call it, like, um, of, Dividing the roles, dividing the work between yeah. them. Division of labor. Division, Division of, of labor. labor, yeah. Within a team, <laughs> you mean? Yeah. Um, obviously, y you could do that. Um, I I'm the kind of person who, who, who likes this stuff. So, so coding for me is, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. So for me, it's, it's, it's not a question. I'll continue doing this indefinitely. I, I used to do basic and SQL, you know, but that was way back. And But now I'm doing it again. This, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, but, but my problem, which uh, this is a question which I've basically left unanswered because I don't know the answer, is um, it's not so much a team where you can have a division of labor there, that's not a problem, that, 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 that'll sort itself out. But it's mostly the, my colleagues out there at large. How am I going to, uh, what, what am I going to advise them? Am I going to tell them, okay, start learning to, uh, uh, to code? And most of them will say, uh, no, sorry, this is not my world. Um, and, and, and digital humanities will remain a niche forever. Uh, or should you tell them, um, okay, um, we've, we've, we've got little bits and pieces and we can show you exactly what they do by, by showing you the results rather than, you know, what happens under the hood. Um, and you can apply that to your own um, uh, project then. Um, but I'm not sure whether that's enough I mean, because I'm giving them the advice, you know, remain in control. Anything you do, don't lose that. I mean, a researcher needs to remain in control. Is that enough uh, to... A division of labor. I mean, you have developers in a team. We have huge amounts of money in the projects we have now, but for this specific project, which I, you know, thought of doing myself as kind of a side shoot from from the major projects, I didn't want to impose on the budget uh, by uh, getting a developer. Um, but that was one reason. But the other reason is simply I wanted to do it myself, S simply to get the skills. But it's 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 an open question. It's a difficult one. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's easy. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to ask, um, you say small is better. Um, is it a small um, or simple? Simple. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, is it a matter of size? <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, in, in both, I think both answers would, would uh, simple and small as well. Um, I'll, I'll begin with the small and then come back to the simple. <laughs> um, the, the small in terms of, of um, uh, data sets, so size ma matters. That's one of the conclusions which I think will come out of our uh, projects, is that if you uh, simply... Uh, I, I showed you the, the, the Delphi Engram viewer, right? With all the records from the Dutch national... Um, uh, um, the, the newspaper archive, and it gives you over so many millions of articles, it gives you this graph. Um, it is so big and so difficult to, to, um, to know what exactly is going on that it becomes meaningless at some point. And, and that is a problem which you find in, in, in um, doing newspaper uh, research um, using large data sets. It gets more uh, useful, more uh, to the point if you reduce the data set. So instead of working with a data set of um, uh, let's say uh, 5 million uh, records, reduce it to 5,000 or, or 50,000 perhaps. But, but in that sense, um, size really, really does matter. It, it, it's, it, it makes you, um, you have to drop all kinds of sub-questions, of course, because all these small things will eventually add up and then you can run again and see whether the results uh, correspond, you know, running it on a large data set. But the, one of the results of our projects is that um, it, it, it's still big enough to call it digital humanities, but it's, uh, it's a lot less big than the people who make claims about big data. Uh, we have these centuries of, of material and now we're going, to, we're going to change the world. That simply that doesn't, doesn't work. And simple is, is better because simple, uh, as for example my code is very simple, um, uh, even I can understand it. So it, it allows me to remain in control. So it's both small and simple, yeah, good question. Thank you. Even one small last question, and then we go to the next speaker, but then more questions will be. Uh, 
Yes, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm using this as a, as a model for, for myself, for, for future projects. I, I found it very, very enlightening. I want to ask you precisely about this, small and big. So, and I would like you to speculate for all of us who are going to do similar things. Uh, I mean, what you get is a map of a geographical imaginary in, in, in this material you have. And my question is, in what ways, I mean, obviously, had you done it with the whole newspaper material, not just the weather forecast and a, and a longer period, you might, I mean, then you would have included some more ideas about temporal change and you would have encountered a lot, lot more of OCR problems and things like that. But would, uh, would the results be significantly different if you had taken, say, the whole newspapers from the same period and then plotted a map and done this, uh, yeah, okay. recognizing this stuff? Yeah, so, this so, so not, not extracting the weather forecasts, but simply taking everything. Yeah, I know, but, but um, that, that is one of the... the um, um, I'm going to be critical, okay? <laughs> uh, that, that would be one of the pointless uh, big data questions, because then you would be mixing up advertisements with, um, with newspaper articles, for example, which is, you know, they're different. You, wh why compare them? Uh, then I would say, okay, take a set of advertisements and then, then, uh, then see what you get. Um, you, uh, if you take only articles, you, you'd be mixing things again. Weather forecasts, I can say, this is something where people look at because it's, it's, uh, you, there's anthropological uh, research has been done into this. People go to the page where the weather forecast is, so I'm pretty sure that it was often read. Articles, you know, any article out there are, you know, skipped or, or you know, you just, just looked at very briefly. Um, but, okay, suppose I would do it, so <laughs> I'm, now I'm not being critical. Um, then would it be different? Yes, of course, because um, what I'm looking at here is Europe. So um, if you take the whole data set, you'd be looking at the whole world, which would give you a, a different uh, picture, perhaps. Um, if I would look only at Europe, because that would, could be done, and just looking at the European place names in, in all the articles, uh, you'd get a different map. Yeah, definitely, because you know political events take place at um, uh, specific places. So that is actually my next step once I've done the weather forecasts. Uh, I want to find a way of you know, sorting out the um, uh, articles which have different themes, like pol politics, for example, so get the polit political articles, and then get the political articles in Europe, and then run it again and see what kind of... Uh, so, so, I mean, aside from the criticism, it, it really is fun doing this. You, you can do a lot of uh, different... There's a lot of different ways of simply plotting place names on a map. I hope that answers your question, and otherwise, during the coffee break... Uh, <laughs>